All right, hello folks. Uh, my name is David Shelburne and we are starting our South Houston Bible Institute course on the book of Judges. I am a newbie when it comes to Zoom, so I may make a lot of mistakes, <laughs> but hopefully you can hear me. Uh, feel free to yell at me, uh, unmute and yell at me if you can't hear me or if you have a question. And if you yell loud enough, I'll probably hear you. That would be a good thing. You sound just fine to me. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we also have a couple of folks who braved the snow uh, to make it in uh, in person in class here. And if you guys have a question, I'll probably hand you the mic or a comment. So that way, the people who are on Zoom can get the benefit of your questionable benefit of your vast wisdom. All right. Okay, as far as attendance, let me read off who I have already noted on here. I'm supposed to take this and turn it in. I have Lisa Caldwell, Donna Carter, Annette Miner, Reginald Wyatt, Bob, and I'm assuming Lana Creel, Karen Sanders, and Rhonda Newbold. Did I miss anybody? Yeah, me. Deafening silence means that we're good. Yes, yes, I. <laughs> oh, Brother Shelburne. Ken Vavar. Yes, sir. And Emmanuel. Okay. Yes, sir. Emmanuel, uh, where are you located? In England. In England, okay. So that's why you didn't make the commute. <laughs> yes. We're glad to have you. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me see if we are complete here. Let's begin with a word of prayer and then we will jump right in. I want to let the folks who are in person uh, leave as promptly as possible at the regular time so that they don't have to fight freezing roads. It's actually winter here, which is a pretty rare thing, but it is. Shall we pray? Holy Father, as we approach your presence, your throne, and your word with trembling, may you fill our minds with wisdom, and may you enable us to know you better, to understand your ways and your thoughts, which are higher than ours. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I'll be right back. I need to hand out. Uh, you, you guys have uh, copies of this? All right, very good. Okay. The book of Judges is an ugly book. The book of Judges is basically two-thirds of a Clint Eastwood movie title. You've heard of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Judges is primarily the bad and the ugly. Sorry to say, but that's pretty much what it is. When I read the book of Judges, I'm reminded of a really mean character I knew in a neighborhood not far from here years ago. I knew him when he was an older man. But as a younger man, he had been a very violent soul. In fact, he had spent time in prison for murder and some other things. When I met him, he had since met the Lord and become a fiery Christian. But he told me stories on the road trip to Dallas one time. He told me of a time when he was young and married and he was off working and he came home unexpectedly one day and found his wife in bed with another man. Well, being the violent, angry fellow that he was, he pulled the fellow out of bed and beat him to a pulp. And then he dragged him out and chained him to the rear bumper of his car and drove through the streets of town to the police station to turn the rascal in. And he said, when I got there, they arrested me, me. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Well, in the book of Judges, I'm going to suggest to you that the God who had married Israel in the great ceremony at Sinai 
The whole basis of this story is the basis of covenant. And without that, we will really not understand it. In this particular story, if I may put it this way, God is meaner than a junkyard dog. He's more hostile than a rattlesnake with dysentery. God is an angry God in this book. And we will not understand that anger unless we understand the passionate white hot heat of a jilted lover. God had married Israel and he had said, one thing you shall not do is that you shall not play false to me. You shall not give your love to another. And that's what Israel basically does in the book of Judges. And in response, God basically beats the snot out of them, drags them out and chains them to the bumper of his 57 Chevy and drags them to the police station. Okay, you probably haven't heard that image before, but that's because most of the teachers you've had up to now were saying, I'm not. Okay. Here's the question. How God grades groups. Does God judge groups of people? For instance, churches or nations? What do y'all think? Hello? I'll take a shot at an answer. Go ahead. I believe God is a just God. So he must judge sin when sin tries to come into his presence. Good answer. Does God judge groups? I think the answer is yes. Now, we don't, those of us who are older have lived in a country where the focus of Western thought has been mostly on the individual, especially in religion, you know, God's relationship to you or God's relationship to me. But God does, according to scripture, judge groups as well. But here's the problem. Nobody goes to heaven or hell on a group rate, right? Doesn't God say in the book of Ezekiel, the son shall not die for the sins of the father. The father shall not be judged for the sins of the son. That's good news if you had a scoundrel for a father. On the other hand, if you had a dad as good as mine, you might want to ride on his coattails. However, none of us really gets to do that. Therefore, when God judges groups, he has to do it in the here and now. The judgment that falls on groups happens now, not later. It happens within the confines of space and time. It happens in history. I have to tell you that I was an excellent student academically. The thing that I hated most in school was being put in a group where we were going to do a group project and get a single group grade. I hated that because some schmo like Dave over here sitting in the classroom would goof off, not do their part, and then I would suffer academically. My grade point would suffer because of that idiot over there. You ever felt that way? Or maybe you were the idiot, I don't know. <laughs> maybe you were hoping that, you know, I'm gonna join her team because she's gonna be, she's an A student. I hated that. But the fact is God does judge groups. He judges nations. If we took out all the material in the Old Testament about God judging the nation of Israel, what you'd have left would be a tract short enough to read over tea time, pretty much. Also, if you look in the prophets, it is very common to find prophecies that are directed against other nations, not just Israel. For instance, if you read Amos chapters 1 and 2, God says, I have this against Edom, I have this against Ammon, I have this against this country, I have this against that country. There are about six or seven countries crammed into two chapters, all of which come under God's judgment. The book of Nahum is an extended judgment pronounced against Nineveh, the capital of the ancient kingdom of Assyria. The book of Obadiah is one chapter, and it is a judgment against Edom. And then there is Daniel chapter 5. Picture this in your mind, because this is a quintessential moment. It, this is the very end of the Babylonian Empire. Basically, the Medes and the Persians, who would be the next world empire, had already taken with their armies, they had surrounded the city of Babylon. They, were, they had laid siege to it. And on that night, which was the final night of Babylon's ascendancy, you'd think they'd be doing everything in their power to hold military con, you know, 
Con they'd, they'd be planning and looking for a way to extend their life. Know what they were doing was having a mad party. They were partying like there was no tomorrow. And for once, they were right. <laughs> there was no tomorrow. And some half drunk idiot said, I know. Let's go get the golden goblets and the silverware and, and, and the stuff that came from Jerusalem. Let's take Yahweh's silverware and use it, his cups and his goblets, and use it to feast our gods. So they did. And as they were feasting and drinking with Yahweh's dinnerware, suddenly a visible hand with fingers appeared next to the wall and began writing on the wall four words, many, many, tekel, Parson. The king was terrified. I think the goblet probably dropped from his frozen hand. He couldn't understand or interpret the words, and he promised a mountain of gold and the election to third most powerful ruler in the kingdom to whoever could. Well, Daniel was brought in. Daniel translated the words, which basically meant, O king, God has weighed you in the balances and found you wanting. You have been judged. So Daniel was basically buried in gold and elevated to become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. You know how long Daniel's uh, ascendancy lasted? One verse. That's right. One verse. He got appointed that night and the kingdom fell a few hours later. <laughs> so game over. Does God judge nations? Absolutely, God judges nations. Well, what about our nation? Would God judge nations in the modern era? Would God judge, say, the United States of America? I'll... Most definitely. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah, I think he might. I think he might. It seems to me that in spite of the fact that we are like an airplane that, you know, when you're, when you're flying at 30,000 feet in a commercial airliner and you approach your destination, eventually you feel the plane begin to slow and the attitude of the plane changes. You begin to sense that the nose is dropping a little bit. Now, if you are close to your destination, that's appropriate. You expect that to happen. Speed's going to bleed off and you're going to begin to descend. But if you're still somewhere out over the middle of the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean, and you get this sense that the nose is tilting downward. That ain't good. <laughs> that is not good. And suppose you're a little bit worried. You're thinking, I'm not sure we're level. And all of a sudden, there's a lurch. And all of a sudden, now you drop several more degrees down. Now you know this is not good. At that point, panic might want to set in. But like the folks in Babylon, I get the impression that our leaders and our country as a whole is partying like there's no tomorrow. Now, what's the worst thing that can happen to a country that's partying like there's no tomorrow? You know what the answer is? Tomorrow. That's the scariest thing that can happen. And we are on the cusp of tomorrow. All right. I'm going to attempt to share something with you on the screen here. I've never done this live in uh, Zoom. So Can I say something I'm, I'm quickly? for the best. <laughs> uh, this is a song which was written by Johnny Cash and kind of caps encapsulates the message of the book of Judges. Let me see if I can bring this up. Oh. 
All right, I understand we're having some issues with the song coming across over Zoom. We'll work on that. Classic song by Johnny Cash, not a particularly comforting one, but yeah. God is a holy and just God. And when his people who are covenanted to faithfulness betray him, there are consequences. And that's as much a part of the truth of scripture as anything else. You know, I think that a lot of our evangelism goes awry because we want to begin with a loving, touchy-feely God who loves people and accepts them just the way they are. And there's a problem with that theology. If you say to somebody, I've got good news for you. The God of heaven loves you deeply. Well, the typical response you're going to get is, yeah, so <laughs> why should that impress me? That is why evangelism in the Bible begins with a crisis and ends with a Christ. Let me repeat that. It begins with a crisis and ends with a Christ. <clears throat> and we have often left out the crisis. We tell people that God is eager to save them and they say, from what? <laughs> what do I need saving from? And that's important. Okay, let me stop share here and go back to this screen. All right. If God judges us, on what basis does he judge nations? And the answer that I'm going to give you If I can get to my Bible here online. Wait a minute. I'm not sharing, am I? No, sir. Okay, hang on a sec. Um, I'm, I'm getting there. All right, can you all on Zoom see that now? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's on the screen. I'm sorry? On the screen now? 
We can see it. Okay, good. All right, I'm actually headed to the Book of Romans for the moment. Okay. He says, coming down to verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress. That would be Johnny Cash. God's going to cut you down. For every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. I uh, want to modernize this a bit. The Jew and the Greek would be pretty much everybody, either the Jew, God's people, or the Gentile, anybody else. So let's put it into terms that would be uh, more fitting for our society. How about there will be trouble and distress for everyone who does evil, the jock first and also the, the geek. Some of you are jocks and some are geeks. Some of you are athletics and some are academics, right? <laughs> Which are you? For everyone. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. For, this is verse 12, all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. In this verse, he makes clear that all human beings are accountable at some level before God. But the level is different. The level by which we are judged is according to the light or understanding that we have, not the understanding we don't have. The Jews had the law. Therefore, they would be judged by God according to the provisions of the law. The Gentiles or the Greeks did not have the law, and so they would be judged apart from the law. 4 verse 13, it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So, the principle here is the more you know, the more you owe, right? Now you're regretting that you took this course. <laughs> the more that you know, the more responsible you are before God. Dang, that's not encouraging, but it's a fact. And so he says that all human beings are made in God's image. That means that the basic law of truth, the moral law, is written on our hearts, and we know this is true. There is no society that does not have a moral code. It may be thoroughly damaged and, and warped, but every society has a moral code. They have a sense of right and wrong. They cannot escape. And so we are judged, all of us, according to the understanding of the light that has been made available to us. Every society has what we might call an ought, what you ought to do or ought not to do. And here's my problem, folks. I came back to America. I was born and raised in Malawi, Africa. Came back to America to stay when I was 14 years old. Raised in a family where the Bible was literally shoveled down our throats daily by my parents. I knew the Old Testament backward and forward when I was knee high to a grasshopper. I looked at my country, America. You know, I was born as an alien in another country. Came back to my country. The more I got to know America, the more I realized how many ways we were rebelling against God and how many ways we were violently abusing his grace. And the Old Testament told me that such people would be judged rather harshly by God. And I spent about two decades playing Habakkuk, saying, God, I don't understand. What we're doing surely deserves terrible judgment, but I can't see it happening. If we are so bad and your word is so true, why are things so good with us? Where's the judgment? The plane's flying just fine. And then we moved into 2000. And then we moved into 2005 and 2010, 2015, 2020. And I felt 
the vehicle's balance begin to wobble <laughs> and the wheels start to come off. And I watched a nation that used to pride itself on being so first world. And over and over on news programs, you've heard this too, I know you have. I heard commentators talk about the supply chain difficulty and the shortage of this and the crisis of that and the rising tide of violence and the incapacity of Washington to get anything done. And over and over and over, people would start saying, you know, this is just like living in the third world. This is like living in a banana republic. And over and over, I heard somebody say, how can this be happening here? How can this be happening here? We're not a banana republic, are we? <laughs> and in my spirit, over and over what I have heard for now several years is, this is what judgment looks like. And it's scary. Habakkuk thought that God was not paying attention because all around him, his fellow Jews were doing terrible things and getting away with it. And in chapter two, God said to Habakkuk, don't you worry. I'm going to take care of this. And when you do, it's going to be ugly. And when God told him how ugly it was going to be, Habakkuk changed his tune and said, oh, uh, not that hard, God. <laughs> not, not, not that much judgment, please. And in chapter three, Habakkuk comes to a place where he says, I accept your judgment, O God, and I accept that you will be merciful even in the midst of judgment. So this is the beginning of what judgment looks like. All right, let's move to another scripture, Leviticus chapter 26. We're going to talk about something that I call the rages of God and the stages of God. You see, not only does God judge us, but when he judges us, he, he tells us exactly how it's going to go. In Leviticus 26, he actually lists four stages of discipline from God for his people, Israel. In this chapter, he says, in the first 13 verses, if you are faithful to my covenant, I will bless you. I'll do good to you. This is a repeat, basically, of Deuteronomy 28. If you are faithful to my covenant, I will bless you so many ways, you will hardly be able to stand it. Do you remember back in the days when Trump was campaigning first time for president? He said, you're going to get tired of winning. <laughs> Whether or not you think that's what happened. Basically, God says, I'm going to bless you so much, you're going to get tired of winning. But chapter 26, verse 14, if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes, if your soul abhors my rules so that you do not do all my commandments, but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. And I can paraphrase what he says here by saying, I'm going to drag you outside and chain you to my rear bumper and drag you to the police station. Okay. This is stage one. He says, I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that consumes the eyes and makes the heart ache. You will sow your seed in vain for your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you, and you will be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. That is stage one. Stage one is not great. In fact, it's pretty harsh, but it only gets worse from there. <laughs> Verse 18, if in spite of this you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins. He spends the next several verses in stage two, and it gets really, really ugly. The whole purpose of these successive stages of harsher and harsher punishment is God's hope that there will be repentance and he will not have to destroy them utterly. Verse 21, stage three. Then if you still walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will continue striking you sevenfold for your sins. And he goes on for a couple of verses and describes how much worse it's gonna get. Verse 23 is stage four. And if by this discipline you are not turned to me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I myself will strike you sevenfold for your sins. And at the end of stage four, you have been conquered, you have been taken away from your country, and you have been dispersed in the land of your enemy. You have been taken by plague and by famine, 
Actually, I think there's stage five here, verse 27. But if in spite of this, you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury. In fury. You hear what God is saying? He is going to be an enraged God. Not good. Not good. But this is the way it is laid out in Scripture. He is saying there are ways when God makes a covenant with you, then he will discipline you for your good. But in the end, if you despise God and rebel and will not turn around, he will destroy you almost to a man. If you finish out that chapter, by the way, there is a gleam of hope. There's an outline to the dark cloud in which he says, if I have mercy on you in the end, it will be because of your righteous parents. <laughs> I hope that you folks had righteous parents or grandparents because it can buy you grace and mercy in the eyes of God. If you don't, your only hope is Jesus. Not a bad hope to fall back on, just say it. We could go from there to 2 Kings chapter 17, which I will not do and read. But in, in 2 Kings chapter 17, there is a break in the story. There's a break in the narrative in which the northern kingdom of Israel that had split off from the southern kingdom has just been conquered by the Assyrian Empire. And their people have been taken away from the land, most of them killed and the rest distributed and flung far out. That's why we call them the 10 lost tribes. They were lost by the Assyrians. They were destroyed. And then for about half a chapter in 2 Kings 17, the writer stops and he says, folks, what happened to Israel is just what God said would happen. He said, I told you, and I told you, and I told you, and I told you, and I told you. Then he sent prophets to tell them again, and again, and again, and they would never Never listen. They would not listen. They were a little bit like Sheldon on Big Bang Theory. <laughs> God said, I told you so. Like this. Normal circumstances, I'd say, I told you so. But as I have told you so with such vehemence and frequency already, the phrase has lost all meaning. Therefore, I will be replacing it with the phrase, I informed you thusly. Can't wait for that to start. I informed you thusly. Page for 28. This is where we could have been if we hadn't stopped for dinner. This is where we could have been if Cooper Polly hadn't ordered dessert. Why well, only do I eat all the broccoli? <laughs> where we are, the runts in a large litter, unlikely to ever reach the nourishing teats of Indiana Jones. <laughs> okay. That was Sheldon's disgust at not being able to make the movie on time because they decided to stop and eat. Let me see if I can get back to my screen here. What have I done? And resume share. Can I say something quickly? I'm sorry? Can I say something quickly? What, what about Sodom and Gomorrah, where Abraham pleaded with God and said, if there are 10 righteous men, would you save this city? That's an excellent question. Uh, I don't know if you folks on Zoom heard that. Uh, let me... Yes, we can hear it. I could. Okay, good. Um, I'm trying to find. There, okay. What about Sodom and Gomorrah, where he said, if there were 10 righteous people there, I would not destroy it. 
It's an excellent point for all the wicked people there are in the United States or United Kingdom or wherever you might happen to be. We still have a lot of good people here, right? We hope. <laughs> yes. So is there a principle in Genesis 18 where God would withhold judgment because of a remnant or a minority of righteous people? I think the best answer I can give you is maybe. But the point that I would make is that if you follow that story through, you will discover that God did not spare Sodom because of the number of righteous people that were there. You say, well, isn't that what he said he would do? Yes, but that's not why he did it. Who was asking God to do this? Anyone? Abraham did, and God had made a covenant with Abraham. Ah, there you go. Remember what we said, what we saw in Leviticus 26, the part we did not read. He said, if I have mercy on you, it will be because of your righteous ancestors, because of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. If you follow the story through when there were not even 10 righteous in Sodom, and so God rescued four, which became three on the way out. And then he rains down his judgment in fire and brimstone on the city. There's a fascinating verse at the end of chapter 19 where it says, and so when God rained destruction on the cities of the plague, he remembered, and you would think it would say he remembered Lot, he rescued him, it's not what it says. It says he remembered Abraham, that's who he remembered. In other words, Lot was not saved because of his or his wife's righteousness. Lot's fat was pulled out of the fire literally as a favor to Abraham. That's why. <laughs> so we better hope that there are enough Abrahams. It's not just the number of righteous people that will necessarily save America from serious judgment or destruction. It is the number of Abrahams who are pleading with God for mercy. That is the biblical principle. But it's still a good point. God is concerned for his people. Let me give you another parallel or another example. In the time of Daniel, when Daniel was raised in Jerusalem, most of the Israelites were wicked. Most of them were worshiping idols. Daniel was an exception. It does not pay to be a righteous minority in the midst of a wicked majority. Why? Babylonians came. They sacked and burned the city. They took all these young men captive, the righteous right along with the wicked. What happened? What happened was exactly what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. I have seen this happen under the sun, that the righteous receive according to what the wicked deserve, and the wicked what the righteous deserve. Daniel suffered not because he was personally wicked, but because he lived in a time where they group judgment that came from God. You know, it sucks to be you. <laughs> it's a bad time to be alive. Just a fact. I once wrote a poem about this. I can't remember if I can quote it offhand, but basically it said, Humpty Dumpty was not a bad egg, but merely lacked muscle control and the good sense to avoid incidents that occur where a height meets a hole. You know, not a bad egg, but he was in a bad situation. The second verse went on to about basically to be about Daniel. It wasn't Daniel's fault, but he still took it on the chin. You know, think of all the dead infants and children in Chicago that have been slain by drive-by fire. This is what we're talking about. It is a terrible thing to be in a society that is experiencing the severe judgment of God. Now, our comfort as Christians, of course, is that what happens to our physical bodies is not the end of the line. It's not the end of the story. If you dodge every stray bullet, and you live to a ripe old age and cancer doesn't touch you and heart, you know, you don't have a coronary, guess what? You're still gonna die, right? The timing is variable, the end result is guaranteed. We believe in the resurrection, so none of that ultimately is of the deepest concern. But in terms of the group judgment of God, we may experience unpleasant things because of the group grade that we get, which may not be all that good. Does that help with the Sodom and Gomorrah thing. 
Yes, sir. Cool. <laughs> Let's see, what time is it? 6.17. So could you say that the Christian may suffer due to the wickedness of a group of people, sort of like a military term of collateral damage? That is exactly right. Collateral damage. Uh, for instance, if we uh, pass the threshold of nuclear war at some point in the near future, if Putin gets mad enough or one of our leaders gets mad enough or somebody just makes a mistake, if those of us who live in Lubbock, Texas, where I am, are probably not going to be bad, too badly affected by a nuclear strike. They're not going to target Lubbock. We're in flyover country. <laughs> if you're a Christian living in New York City, uh, you could be collateral damage. You, you hear what I'm saying? It doesn't mean you're a worse Christian. Luck of the draw. Some of evil is random. It's kind of the nature of the business. Okay, where were we going with that? Where we are going with that is that we are at a great point to take a bathroom break. And so I'm going to set this down and, and, and step away for about five minutes so you all can do whatever you need to do. It is 6.18. I'll plan to be back by about 6.22. Deal? Sounds good. See you then. You know, we see that same picture in the New Testament with Jesus looking over Jerusalem and weeping. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see in the Old Testament God weeping, you know, which is to me the problem people have with the Old Testament is the, the, the emphasis is so much on the judgment. You see, and uh, if, if we could see, if the prophets would, would help us see God weep, you know, it would, it would, it would make a different story, wouldn't it? How about this look at the metaphor of dance? <laughs> <laughs> Could I get a, a drink of water? Oh, what's well, close waters in the kitchen? Yeah, there might be. If, if not, I appreciate it. Jason had a brother who was. He said All right. I'm not used to having to work a the technology while I also think about my speaking. <laughs> it would be very difficult for me. Okay, it's six twenty one. I'm going to cheat a little bit because this is this is a uh, just extra. So much of the Old Testament is given to warning about the dangers of disobedience and rebellion. Many years ago, I wrote a little poem on Deuteronomy uh, in, in kind of a comic tone, but, but in order to capture that sense of God's perpetual nagging. So I'll ask to read this to you. 
Deuteronomy is a lengthy book, 34 chapters. Take a look. And this is odd because when you're done, it's lessons boil down to one. Love, obey, and honor God if you'd prosper on this sod. You be faithful to the Lord or he'll throw you overboard. 34 chapters is a lot to verbalize a single thought. So much ink for just one inkling. What was the motive in God's thinking? So much ink for just one ought. Surely a reason must be sought. If we could ask and God reply, here is a possible reason why. Harp and carp, drill and drum. Why so emphatic? Because you're so dumb. If I don't fret, the point you don't get. When I stop speaking, you stop seeking. Fickle heart and fitful mind, that's the way of humankind. Fitful mind and fickle heart, you don't finish what you start. So if you are to stay the course, I must warn until I'm hoarse. And if someday you'd see my face, the nagging's naught but needful grace. Very good. Okay, let's just get back to scripture here. So we're, as we're talking about the reason that we're looking at a theology of God's judging or, or God's how God grades groups is that the whole story of judges is the story of descent into madness, this descent into a Mad Max world where civilization itself is coming apart. And so we're, I'm wanting to set the stage by kind of exploring the dynamics of what scripture teaches about how God deals with that kind of thing. And I'd like to do a little bit of a, not long, but, but a little bit of a, a deeper dive into Romans chapter one to conclude our look at this. Told you earlier that in scripture, the gospel begins with a crisis and ends with a Christ. And that is powerfully demonstrated in chapter one of Romans. Okay, he says in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, or as I said, to the John first and also to the geek, one or the other, whoever you are. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith for Here's the crisis. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. God has made himself plain through his creation. This is what we call general revelation. I don't care if you've never had a copy of the Bible. The fact that there is a God and something of his nature can clearly be discerned from what he made. I recently heard a speech given in which a Jewish author was cited, and she was talking about Anthony Flew, one of the more famous atheists of our time, who is no longer an atheist. And you know what convinced him? You know what changed his mind? He said that in the end, he realized that even if you could posit some big bang theory where an explosion flung matter across the universe. There is simply no process known to science or to anything else by which conscious mind could emerge from mud. Sentient minds can not come from rocks. They cannot, period. And so Anthony Flew, who is not necessarily a Christian, at least came so far as to say, I came to realize that mind and consciousness can only come from mind, not from matter. It's pretty obvious when you think about it, <laughs> but not to the atheist, but it should be. 
So Paul goes on to say, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. This is a biblical term that is used extensively in the Old Testament. They became fools. They became ignoramuses. They became stupid. Why? Because they knew God, but they did not acknowledge him. You can know, but you pretend not to know. This is like uh, when you're having a problem with someone in your family or a close friend. And you know this person and you walk into the same room with that person, but that person pretends that you don't exist. They will not acknowledge you. Some of you have been in marriages where that happened. That's painful. They knew God, but they would not know. They would not acknowledge God. And so they became fools. Their minds were darkened. By the way, in scripture, the term fool does not mean that you are a moron or an idiot. It means that you have no room for God. Psalm 14, Psalm 53 says what? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And you get really pretty stupid from there. In fact, I had a professor at a local university here who said he once heard a prayer led in church by a man who said, Lord, we want to thank you for making us ignorant. And our prayer is that you will make us ignoranter and ignoranter which is the one prayer my professor went on to say that God could not possibly answer. <laughs> if the beginning of wisdom, what is the beginning of wisdom according to, to the scripture? Fear of God, right? When you're not afraid of God, when you have no reverence toward God, you become a fool. And according to Proverbs, what happens to fools? They die. Foolishness, folly, is where you go to die. Quite simply, it's where you go to die, according to scripture. Well, if individual fools die, what do foolish societies do? They die. <laughs> Quite simple. That's what we learn in scripture. Claiming to be wise, coming back to Romans chapter one, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of God for images of creatures. Now, there are going to be three exchanges in here. The first one is they exchanged God's glory, the glory of the immortal God, for images re resembling creatures, whether human beings or birds or animals or creeping things. This is idolatry. Instead of worshiping the immortal God, they exchanged his glory for something made. Now, you know, I'm a guy. I can understand worshiping at the feet of a beautiful female. But that's all I can understand. The rest of it, frogs, <laughs> I don't understand. And then it says, therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because here's the second exchange. They exchanged what? The truth about God for a lie. So first, they exchanged God's glory for idols. Second, they exchanged the truth for a lie. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. The third exchange is natural relations for unnatural in, in the realm, of, in the sexual realm. Three exchanges. In the same passage, there are three times God gives them up. Verse 24, therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. The first giving up that God does is to give a, a people up to impurity. Can anybody say the sexual revolution? Some of us were alive in the 60s. Got a couple of guys in the room here that were. <laughs> I was born in the mid 60s myself. He gave them up to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves. Then in verse 26, it says, God gave them up to dishonorable passions which he then describes in some detail. And in verse 28, finally, it says, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, he gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And if you want to know what happens to a society that has filled with people whose minds are debased, look at the next two verses. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, 
Anybody raised on the Jerry Springer show? Slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. He's describing a society so filled with hostility and malice that they're turning on each other and ripping each other to shreds. Now that sounds a lot like America to me. And when a nation reaches the point where they don't have to wait for an enemy to conquer them because they're not gonna be anything left for the enemy, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're, we're gonna destroy each other. Who wins? Who wins? in a nation that reaches that point. And I will answer you in a pun, Darwin. Who wins? Darwin. When God is completely out of the picture and it's survival of the fittest or the strongest or the meanest, it's the junkyard dog that wins, it's Darwin. Or the cockroaches, they're supposed to be the only ones that will survive a nuclear blast, right? But do you see what happens here? The people exchange what they knew to be true for something that was not true. They exchange the truth for a lie. They three exchanges and three times God gives them up. This is the book of Judges in theological teaching structure. This is the, this is the we will see this happen in the book of Judges. We will see this literally happen before our very eyes. Romans one walks out what we're about to experience over the next few weeks. I hope none of you were, were depressed when we started this, because <laughs> you can be in serious emotional shape by the time we get through. I'll try to mix a little humor in. But let me leave Romans 1. I, I want to leave you with three things, and I owe this insight to a Scottish pastor who got lost and wound up in Ohio. He said there is a pattern of three things that happen when a nation or a people drop down into total degeneracy. Three things. This is the order. Number one, impiety. Number two, idolatry. And number three, immorality. I repeat that. Number one is impiety. Number two is idolatry. And number three is immorality. And we see all of these in this chapter in Romans. What is impiety? It's the opposite of piety. Piety is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Piety is being devoted to God. You know where idolatry starts? It starts when my affections begin to wander away from God. You know what they call this in marriage? Creeping separateness. If you have been in a marriage that went south, and I have, I know all about that. Do you remember when it first suddenly occurred to you, it hit your conscious mind, my spouse isn't very tender toward me anymore. I don't sense that we are intimate in our spirit. Maybe that progressed to the point where you felt that the spirit or the heart of your spouse was literally closed to you. They're not open anymore. You remember that? I hope you don't. <laughs> but if you've been there, you do remember it. Painful, painful. What happened in Israel? David as a king, told his people, led his people to be faithful to God, absolutely, even though he himself was not 100% that way. But do you remember what the scripture says about his son Solomon? His heart was what? Not fully devoted to God. Not fully. What's that? That's impiety. And what was the immediate result? Idolatry. Solomon married this woman from this kingdom where they worshiped this idol. Next thing you know, that idol has a temple in Jerusalem. And now there's another temple and another one and another one. Impiety, when our hearts begin to separate from total devotion to God, means that we're going to start sending that love somewhere else. We're going to worship something else. And that something will become an idol. So impiety is the first step. When we start drawing our affection away from God, it opens the door to love something else. Whatever that thing is that we love becomes our idol. Now we have idolatry. And once your new God is an idol, there is an inevitable result. You worship an idol long enough and you will have a society that is filled with immorality. That's the pattern of Romans chapter one. It starts when we ignore the great commandment. 
we don't really love him with all of our heart and all of our soul and all our mind and all of our strength. Imagine that you are a man married to, no, no, let me change that image. Imagine you're a woman married to a man and you live in a beautiful neighborhood and suddenly two houses down, a new family moves in. And then you discover that the person, the wife who moves into that family is your husband's old flame. And she is his kryptonite. <laughs> Boy, you are not happy about this. And then they join the same country club. And then even worse, she's hired by the company where your husband works. And then she gets appointed as his assistant. And you tell your husband, if you go near that witch or similar words, this is what I'm going to do to you. You can see the train wreck coming, but you can't seem to stop it. This is the position of God in the book of Judges. You see disaster coming and you warn, you say, stay away from her. <laughs> and it doesn't seem to matter. The train wreck happens anyway. Impiety, idolatry, immorality. And we're gonna see this played out in sky written letters in large print in the story of the book of Judges. Okay. Let me see if I can find. There we are. I've heard people say that the book of Judges seems to be very scattered and very difficult to read or understand. And I can certainly appreciate that. It is a weird and wild book. Yeah, let's get that over there. But it is actually written with an amazing amount of finesse and artistic structure. Uh, this handout is available here in class. And I sent this to those of you, um, I think most of you, I should have sent that in, in the form of an attachment. If you have trouble opening that, I can probably resend it in a PDF format. Basically, judges rolls like this. There is a double introduction and there is a double conclusion. Isn't that weird? Basically two introductions and two conclusions. Let me set this, uh, let me give you an example of how this works. In the book of Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And he goes through six days of creation in chapter one. When you start Genesis chapter two, all of a sudden you're back in the beginning and there's a story of, of creation all over again from a different viewpoint, from a different angle, different details. But you basically have a double introduction to creation. In the book of Genesis, same thing in the book of Judges. The difference is in the book of Judges, the first introduction focuses upon Israel's military failure, and the second introduction will focus upon their spiritual or religious failure. Now, skip the middle and let's run right on down to the double conclusion. Most of the book of Judges, no surprise, is about judges and they're named. Many of them are famous, Samson, Gideon, Barak, Deborah, and so forth and so on. The last four chapters or five of the book of Judges doesn't mention any judges. It's simply two of the most awful stories in the entire Bible. The first story is the story of the religious disintegration of Israel, told from the perspective of a character by the name of Micah, and the tribe of Dan. The second story, chapters 19 through 21, is the moral and physical disintegration of Israel. So the first conclusion is the religious disintegration. The second conclusion is the moral and physical disintegration told through the story of a Levite and the tribe of Benjamin. So in both cases, you have a man and a tribe who kind of focus the story. Remember in the introduction, there was a military failure and then there was a religious failure, right? In the conclusion, you have the opposite order. There is a religious disintegration and then there is a military disintegration, which involves the moral and physical collapse of the nation and it ends in fire, it ends in warfare. So the two conclusions and the two introductions are mirror images of each other, basically. The stories, thematically parallel each other in opposite order. They form a double parenthesis around the middle. All right, fine, what's in the middle? 
<laughs> the middle is six cycles of major judges with a few minor judges who are just mentioned thrown in. Six cycles. Double introduction, double conclusion wrapped around six major story cycles. And that's it. That's the book. Cycle number one is Othniel, and the enemy he fights is the Mesopotamian. Cycle number two is Ehud. If you have a son in today's world, don't name him that. You might as well name him Ludwig. He'll be persecuted either way. Enemy, the Moabites. Then we have the first minor judge thrown in, simply mentioned, no story attached. Cycle number three is the story of Deborah and Barak, or Barak, which we know now because we've had a president recently by that name. The enemy in this case were the Canaanites. Notice that in each case, there will be a different major enemy. Cycle number four is the cycle that involves Gideon and a son of his by the name of Abimelech. And the enemy in this cycle is the Midianites. At this point, we have two other minor judges thrown in, Tola and Jair. Again, we know essentially nothing about them except for the barest detail. Cycle number five, the major cycle, is the story of Jephthah. In this case, the enemy is the Ammonites. And then we have three minor judges thrown in for good measure. You notice how this builds. One minor judge is mentioned, then two are mentioned together, and now three. So very artful. <laughs> and then finally, the, the last major story cycle will be the story of Samson, who, by the way, is the most broken person nearly in this entire book until you get to the folks at the end who are really badly broken. But um, I remember the story told by a, a preacher friend of mine who lives up in Denver. He was uh, doing a Bible school for kids, like a summer Bible camp or something, and they were doing a story each morning. And this poor guy had to play Samson for one of these stories. And unfortunately, he was tall and skinny with a concave chest. He was the most unsansom like character you could. And he was just a nice guy. I mean, and he had to pretend to be this fierce Overly muscled, terrifying guy. It was so silly to hear him talk about how I made a terrible Samson. Well, folks, Samson made a terrible Samson. Samson was almost irredeemably weak. And the irony is that when we tell stories from the book of Judges, we typically present the judges that we're talking about as heroes. We present them as people who are giants of the faith. And they had their moments, no question, they had their moments. But as we go through and look at what the text actually says about these judges, you will discover that not only are they deeply flawed, every, nearly every last one of them is a deeply flawed human being, but as we go from judge to judge, they get worse. They get worse as time goes on. And the fact that the Spirit of God landed on them and that they did something great for the country is not a great recommendation of their character as a whole. For the most part, this is a desperately sad story. It is not a comedy, it's a tragedy in Shakespearean terms. And these folks are tragic. And the point of the Bible, if we're going to take it contextually, is to show us that even when God had almost nothing to work with, <laughs> even when he was down to the dregs, which he certainly was in the case of Samson, even then, his mercy brought temporary relief to his people. Even then, his compassion delayed their final destruction. I had an analogy. Dang it, I can't remember what it was. It was a good one, so I'm going to think on it for a minute. <laughs> Let me see if I've got something in my notes here that I'm missing. Ah, okay. Let me close, because we have about four minutes left here, with an observation. If you have been raised in 21st century America, especially if you are younger, but even if you're older, this may be true you may find the book of Judges to be a really, really 
emotionally difficult book. And I say that because we're going to learn things about God that are not polite. Let me just put it blank, very, very bluntly. The God that we encounter in the book of Judges is not very nice. In fact, he's not nice at all. And there will be a strong tendency, unless I'm mistaken, you may discover a strong tendency in you or in people around you to dislike the God that we encounter in this book. He may offend your sensibilities powerfully. And it wouldn't be the first time he did that. I mean, those of us who were raised with this automatic worship and respect for the Bible, we didn't really deal with this nearly as much. You know, we'd read Genesis 22 and God says to Abraham, uh, Abraham, take your son that you waited for all those years, your only son that you love so deeply, and stick a knife in him and a fork in him. You know, tie him up, put him on a stack of rocks and rip his heart out. And we would all go, yeah, God said it. That, that makes good sense. Sure. <laughs> At least I could say that until I had a kid of my own. It's terrifying. What kind of a God? Some of you may, before we get very far into the book of Judges, in fact, starting next week, you may be saying inside your internal dialogue, will be saying, man, this God's a monster. And I understand if that's the response that comes out of your heart when you start reading about what God does and says in this book. Now, let me ask you, the sensibilities that are offended in you or that are offended in me when we read about some of God's less polished behavior, where did those sensibilities come from? Who formed your idea of right and wrong? Was it the Bible? Was it this culture? Was it the spirit of the age? Is the God that you grew up believing in or thinking about a God who is gentle and kind, kind of a cosmic Santa Claus, more than an ogre waiting to roast you over a fire? Some of you may have had that severe God. I don't know. But here is the challenge to you. If the God that you meet in Scripture is extremely uncomfortable for you in a particular moment and you're feeling a tension inside of you and you want to say, I don't know if I like this God, guess what? You're not required to like this God. You are required to love him. You're not required to automatically agree with him, but you are required to obey him. That is, if you're a Christian, if, you have, if you're in a covenant relationship. And this is going to be a real challenge. But let me suggest to you in closing this strange truth. The most subtle idolatry of all is for me to construct a God in my image and pretend that he is the God of Scripture. You see, I think I'm worshiping Yahweh, but I'm worshiping somebody that might be a little bit like Yahweh, but he's a lot more urbane and polite and polished. In other words, he's a God with all the rough edges knocked off. He's a God I can take out in this society without being embarrassed. Or maybe the real God is not. So here's the challenge. We're going to wrestle with this, and you have a right to ask any question you want to ask, but it may just be that the American church has to a large degree constructed a very, very subtle idol that is like, but is not quite the God of the Bible. We're going to work on that. Okay, it is time. I'm sorry I did not leave time for questions or comments. I'll try to do more of that as we go. I'm still trying to learn this silly Zoom stuff. <laughs> I'm just happy I made it through alive. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> so you did a great you. job. Uh, we yeah. will meet uh, for the next several weeks. Uh, I sent the, the rest of you a syllabus. Those dates are not printed in stone. Obviously not. They went through the ether on an email. But the point is, uh, come spring break, if we're still doing this, you know, we might take a week off. We'll talk about that so there may be a little, you know, a little flexibility, but basically we'll be meeting at this time, 5.30 to 6.50 each Tuesday evening, unless we don't. Like God, I reserve the right to change my approach. That's the only way we're alike. God bless, and we will see you next time.
Thank you so you much. For a wonderful class. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. God bless you all. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Good night.